Hi, I'm Jim Dennison with Dennison Forum, and this is the Daily Article for Monday, May the 10th, 2021. The title is Rainbow Disney Collection Will Honor LGBTQ Pride Month, How and Why to Be the Visible Presence of God in the World. Let's begin with some good news. You didn't get hit by falling rocket debris yesterday. Remnants of a Chinese rocket landed in the Indian Ocean on Sunday. Most of its components were destroyed upon entering the atmosphere. Parts that survived reentry crashed into the ocean west of the Maldives, a small island chain south of India. However, we don't need threats from space to endanger life on Earth. One of America's largest pipelines was shut down Friday after being hit by a cyber attack. The next day, three bystanders were shot in New York City's Times Square when a man arguing with other people fired wildly into the crowd. One of the victims was a four-year-old girl who was toy shopping with her family and was hit in the left leg. Speaking of children, the Walt Disney Company has unveiled the Rainbow Disney Collection, designed to honor the annual Pride Month in June that celebrates the LGBTQ community and movement. The catalog of apparel and toys features t-shirts, Mickey Mouse ears, mugs, and even baby apparel, all adorned with rainbows. This is just one way Disney seeks to introduce children to LGBTQ ideology. The 2020 Disney Pixar animated film Onward had a minor character who was a lesbian. Pixar's short film Out features a gay lead character, and the Disney Channel cartoon series The Owl House features a bisexual main character. In 2018, Cartoon Network featured a same-sex wedding proposal on the animated series Steven Universe. The network is working to create comic strips asserting that there are multiple gender identities. Earlier this year, the Nickelodeon series Blues, Clues, and You unveiled a song teaching children the alphabet while promoting LGBTQ advocacy. If you're like me, you read such news and feel frustrated that the church isn't doing more to impact the culture. If we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, why is our salt and light not doing more to season and enlighten our culture? Why, in fact, are churches and Christian institutions sometimes the problem more than the solution? In an article published yesterday, David French makes a vital distinction between Christendom and Christianity. He explains in these words, Christianity is the faith, Christians are believers in the faith, and Christendom is the collective culture and institutions, universities, ministries of the faith. French cites the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who saw the Christian institutions of his day as hurting rather than helping the faith. Kierkegaard issued the compelling warning that imitating Jesus, quote, is really the point from which the human race shrinks. The main difficulty lies here. Here is where it is really decided whether or not one is willing to accept Christianity. Kierkegaard then explained the problem in these words. If there is emphasis on this point, the stronger the emphasis, the fewer the Christians. If there's a scaling down at this point so that Christianity becomes intellectually a doctrine, more people enter into Christianity. If it is abolished completely, Christianity spreads to such a degree that Christendom and the world are almost indistinguishable or all become Christians. Christianity has completely conquered. That is, it is abolished. In other words, we can make the imitation of Jesus into doctrines about Jesus and then build institutions to proclaim these doctrines, but we should remember the warning of James 2.19. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. Doctrines and institutions that do not lead people to know and imitate Jesus personally will never change the culture. That's because the culture changes when people change. And people are changed not by our words, but by God's Spirit. People tempted by LGBTQ attraction and ideology are liberated not by protesting against Disney, although we should clearly stand against unbiblical morality, but by the transformation Jesus brings to a life yielded fully to him. For people being tempted by other forms of immorality in our broken culture, the answer is the same. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. A 2,000-year-old marble head of Emperor Augustus has been discovered in a town in Italy. It was originally part of a statue towering at least six feet, seven inches tall. I have seen many such statues of Augustus in museums, each depicting the emperor in power and glory. 
Now, contrast these statues with the earliest image of the Savior born in Bethlehem when Augustus ruled from Rome. This image was made in mockery of the Christian faith. It depicted a donkey-headed Christ on a cross. Other early images made by Christians show Jesus as a shepherd and a healer. Not until the fourth century do we find images of him ruling in authority. This is not because his earliest followers knew Jesus to be anything less than King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Rather, their depictions call us to serve our King by serving others. The more we love Jesus, the more we will love those he loves, and he loves everyone. The Holy Spirit uses changed people to change the world. The apostles could impact the Sanhedrin in Acts 4 by their preaching because their lives had been impacted by the truth they preached. Paul could call multitudes to Jesus, as for instance in Acts 22, because he had been transformed by Jesus. Churches and institutions can call our culture to imitate Jesus to the degree that those who comprise these churches and institutions imitate Jesus. If you and I will meet with our risen Lord every day in worship, submitting to his spirit and asking him to manifest the character of our Lord in our lives, he will answer our prayer. If, like Jesus, we will seek to serve rather than to be served, our Lord will use us to draw others to himself. In his book, Telling the Truth, Frederick Buechner speaks of the visible absence and the invisible presence of God in the world. I would add a third category, the visible presence of God in the world to the people of God in the world. So here's the question, whom will you serve today?